Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank Dr. Callum Littlejohns for inviting me to this forum with the opportunity to present our work. Today, I will discuss the work we have been doing at Futung in characterizing the power and spectral performance of an integrated chip-based axon-like lens developed in a SOI platform which can produce a 850 micron long non-diffracting central lobe with a small 5.7 micron diameter. This kind of device may be beneficial in furthering chip-based imaging devices. Before we begin though, I would like to briefly tell you about Futung Research Institute. We are a relatively new, small, non-governmental, non-profit research lab in Kathmandu, Nepal. We primarily work in the field of optics and photonics. It is quite evident in this community why integration of different components could prove to be beneficial in the long run. Integration of devices would help in miniaturization of different components as well as their encasing systems. Integration also has the social benefit of increasing accessibility to various technologies, especially in the developing world. Integrated optics that are scalable to large-scale production would allow the cost of these devices to be lowered such that a much larger population in the world would get access to the various technologies that would otherwise be inaccessible to them. In this work, we focus on an axon like lens within the context of its use as a potential focusing device. Chip-based devices like these axons have a small footprint and a large depth of focus, which may prove useful in imaging systems such as optical coherence tomography and LIDAR. Traditional axicons are lenses with a planar side and an opposing conical face, as we can see up here in the picture from a sphericon. An ideal axicon can be used to convert any Gaussian beam into a profile similar to a Bessel beam. Axicons have proven to be useful in technologies like optical traps as well as various optical imaging techniques, especially optical coherence tomography. The long non-diffracting central lobe of an axicon can increase the depth of focus in the imaging system. For a chip-based system, we designed a diffraction gratings-based device in a 220 nanometer silicon insulator platform. The chips were fabricated with low-resolution deep ultraviolet lithography with feature sizes in the order of 200 nanometers. The devices consist of circular grating couplers in the center at constant period and constant duty cycle with light pores around the circumference. We feed in light with seven stages of 1 by 2 multimode interferometer splitter couplers that ultimately lead to 128 ports around the circular grating structure. In order to get an idea of how the axon may look like, we simulated two plane waves coming off from the chip at the diffraction angle and with the light penetration depth of the gratings. A full 3D simulation of a large device like this is computationally impractical for us. A 2D simulation of the device would also not be feasible due to the design of the device. So we simply took two plane waves at the diffraction angle set on the basis of the results and performed a simple 2D simulation. The 2D FTTD simulation results presented here show that light from the two sides interfere constructively at the center to form a central lobe from 750 microns to 1000 microns above the chip. It also has a small lobe diameter of only about 7 microns. In typical diffraction gratings, the intensity of light diffracted decreases exponentially with the penetration depth. This behavior is not really suitable for an axon-like device. Higher penetration depth would result in a tighter focus. Traditional methods such as variable apertization would increase the penetration depth, but they are not really feasible with deep UV lithography. We therefore employed azimuthal apertization in the design. To do that, we broke up the circular greetings to a combination of small arcs. Given that the intensity of light decreases exponentially with the penetration depth, we obtained an extinction coefficient using 2D FTTD simulations. We then used the extinction coefficient to increase the arc length of the gratings with the penetration depth. 
the arc length increased until the gap between two arcs reached the minimum feature size of the fabrication, at which point the gratings continued simply as circular regular gratings. We measured the penetration depth in the apodized and the non-apodized structure and found that when the gratings are left completely circular, the intensity of the light diffracted does indeed peak near the edges and decrease exponentially. The net penetration depth in the non-apodized grating design, shown in the open red squares, is 5 microns. In blue filled circles, we show the measurement for apodized gratings. We find that the light diffracts with a nearly constant profile for the first 55 microns, at which point there is a spike in the intensity before it decreases to nearly zero. The spike in intensity corresponds to the point where the arc lengths have reached a maximum and the circular gratings have begun. Presumably, with a smaller minimum feature size limit, we would be able to increase the penetration depth even further. Thus, we show here that the apodization works as intended and successfully increases the penetration depth from 5 microns to nearly 55 microns. To perform a characterization of the device, we used a 1310 nanometer subsource laser with a bandwidth of 100 nanometers. We couple light onto the chip with a vertically held green lens mounted to a ferrule single mode fiber. The output of the chip is collected with a 50 micron multimode fiber and measured with an in gas detector and a power meter. The green lens is mounted on a motorized XYZ stage and the multimode fiber is mounted on a manual XYZ stage. Coupling light in with a standard grating coupler and a single mode fiber would limit the bandwidth to the design of the grating coupler. However, with the system employed here, whereby we collect light from a multimode fiber, a higher spectral bandwidth is obtained owing to a higher numerical aperture and a subsequently larger acceptance cone. We move the green lens point by point along the surface to acquire the planar data as well as a plane perpendicular to the chip surface. Figure B here shows the measurement from the surface of the chip with the data acquired in a XY GUI with 5 micron resolution. The data shows the expected qualitative behavior of the device, consistent with the penetration depth measured previously. While the device is perfectly circular, we note that the measurement data exhibits slight asymmetry due to the errors in the expected versus real movement in the flexure design of the translation stages. Nevertheless, it still shows the qualitative behavior quite well and as expected. Figure A shows the same plane but at a height of roughly 400 microns above the chip where we find the central lobe of the axon. In this high resolution data taken at an XY grid of 1 micron resolution, we see that the central lobe has an average full width at a half maximum diameter of 5.7 microns. Likewise, in figure C, we show the XZ plane acquired at the center line position of the device. The X position has a resolution of 5 microns and the Z position has a resolution of 15 microns in this figure. We can clearly see a central lobe that spans from nearly 350 microns to 1200 microns above the chip surface. The long lobes of about 850 microns would likely prove to be beneficial in imaging applications requiring large depth of focus from the focusing mechanism. The use of swept source laser as the source allows us to characterize the spectral performance of the device as well. However, spectral characterization requires a much faster measurement as the laser sweeps through the wavelengths in its range within 5 microseconds. In order to characterize the spectral performance, we therefore use a high-speed data acquisition card, the Alizar Tech ATS 9350. However, the data acquisition card has a noise, noise floor in the same order of magnitude as the output measured from the device. In order to resolve the spectral information of the chip, we employ a balanced homodyne detection technique. This allows us to boost the signal from the chip with the portion of the signal laser source. In a basic homodyne setup, the light source is split into two parts. One of the parts goes into the chip 
and the resulting weak signal is mixed with the other part, called the local oscillator signal. The local oscillator and the chip signal is mixed in a mixer, and the boosted signal is detected by a suitable optical detector. For our setup, we take the source laser and split it with a 99 to 1 splitter. The 99% line goes to the chip via a green lens, and the 1% line behaves as the local oscillator. The measured value from the chip is then mixed with the local oscillator in a 2x2 mixer. The path length of the chip line and the local oscillator must be nearly equal, and so we place a green collimator pair in the local oscillator path. The two green lenses in the collimator pair are on translation stages, one motorized and one manual, which allows us to adjust the path length until they are nearly equal. When the green lens coupling light onto the chip moves up in height to acquire planar data, the path length of the chip line increases. The motorized translation stage in the green collimator pair in the local oscillator line then moves by the same amount in order to maintain the same path length as the chip line. The mixed signal is measured with a balance detector and the high speed data acquisition card. When the path lengths are nearly equal, the difference between the two signals as measured from the balance detector shows oscillations due to constructive interference, which gives us the chip component. We can see a more detailed explanation of how this works here. The signal from the balance detector or the mixer output is shown in blue open circles. When the chip is disconnected, the oscillations in the blue signal disappears and only the effect of the local oscillator is present, shown in red points. The envelope of the oscillations in blue chip signal represents the chip component of the mixed signal. In order to extract the chip component for analysis, we subtract the local oscillator component from the mixer signal. We then pass the signal through a high pass filter to remove any low order effect to isolate the purely oscillatory component shown in purple in the figure. The envelope of the oscillation can then be extracted with a Hilbert function shown in black. This is the component of the measurement from the chip. Based on the data from the swept source laser manufacturer, we can convert the time scale in the measurement to a corresponding wavelength value, which allows us to examine the spectral performance. As before, we measured point by point to acquire planar data. Here we show data in the XZ plane. While the laser is of 100 nanometer bandwidth, we can isolate measurements at different wavelengths as shown in the previous slide. The figure here shows spectral performance at wavelengths of 1300, 1310, 1320 and 1330 nanometers, integrated over a bandwidth of 10 nanometer. The figures are normalized with each plot's maxima. We find that the position of the central lobe does not vary significantly with wavelength. This could potentially be useful in applications that require a broadband performance. To conclude, let us review the major points. We designed a chip-based hexagon-like lens in a SOI platform using a low-resolution, deep ultraviolet lithography. We employed a novel azimuthal apodization of the gratings and increased the penetration depth by an order of magnitude from 5 microns to 55 microns. The axon presented here produces a non-diffracting central lobe that spans from about 350 microns to 1200 microns and has a central lobe diameter of 5.7 microns. A small spot size like this, with a large depth of focus of nearly 850 micron, may be useful in optical imaging applications. We also implemented a balanced homodyne detection technique to extract the spectral performance of the axon lens and showed that the position of the lobe is nearly constant over the wavelength studied from 1295 to 1335 nanometers. Finally. This work was supported by the EPSRC under the GCRF program and partly by TWAS. I would like to thank the Cornerstone Project at the University of Southampton for the chip fabrication. All the chips in this study were fabricated by Cornerstone. I would also like to thank ANSYS Lumerico for the simulation software, Lucetta Photonic for the IPKIS design software, and Torlabs for various optomechanical instruments. 
once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Callum Littlejohns for inviting me to present the work we did at this forum. I'll take any questions you may have now, either via chat or via the email listed on the slide. Thank you.